everyone. Thank you for tuning in to the Sonora Writers Group author interview today. And my guest is Mike Sullivan, and he has he's been a prolific writer. He's got quite a few books. Um, you can just give us a brief synopsis of the books that you've already written, and then we'll get into the one that he's going to be sharing with us. Well, thank you for having me. Um, actually, I've, I've published ten books. Ten? Uh, <laughs> nine uh, were through CreateSpace, which is uh, a, a website that allows you to download your novels and, and get them onto Amazon. And uh, the tenth one got published by a fluke. Uh, some friends of mine who know a gentleman who has a small publishing company thought that this storyline would be very interesting to him. And they set up a point of contact. He asked me to send him a couple of chapters of the book and a book review from the San Francisco Book Review, which I did. And about a week later, I get a very cordial email back. Uh, and he said, thank you so much, enjoyed your book. However, it's not in the genre that we like to work. But with your permission, I would like to send this to another publisher. So, okay, no harm, no foul. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to replace John Grissom. <laughs> send it. Go ahead. And a couple of weeks later, I get an email from a Frank Eastland of Publish Authority out of Georgia. Very disappointed that we weren't able to read more. Loved the first two chapters. Mm -hmm. Please send us the rest of your manuscript. So, I emailed him the rest of the manuscript. A couple of weeks later, I get a call on the phone saying, thank you so much. We would look enthusiastically to working with you to get your book published. That started a year-long process mm -hmm. uh, of review, of editing, of title design, cover design, title changes, and ultimately, uh, out came the novel Forgotten Flowers. Forgotten Flowers. There we go. Um, okay. Would you like to share a little bit of that with us? Have sure. You I'll picked out something to read. I have picked out. I'll tell you what. Basically, the story centers on a man who has lost his uh, wife to dementia, mm -hmm. and during that long period, unfortunately uh, for him, uh, he tried to get some help. He didn't quite know how to do it, so he offers to volunteer at an assisted living facility and to work with residents there. And his goal was to glean from those encounters and from the staff who work with these ladies and men, what kind of tricks do they use to elicit a memory connection? What is it they say? What is it they do? What do they ask? that would just spark an instant memory mm -hmm. into the present. And so that's his particular goal. Then the story centers on the three, three families who have placed a loved one there. The circumstances led up, that led up to that. And that kind of takes another parallel course through the novel. Okay. Um, I'll read a couple of parts here. One that I, I think explains to the reader the heart of the main protagonist, uh, Daniel Kilgore, and, and the kind of person he is. And the other one, other pa second passage, kind of shows the frustration of the professional caregiver mm -hmm. and what yes. they go through working with these people yes. afflicted with varying levels of dementia. Okay. <clears throat> Daniel Kilgore had been an elementary school teacher then principal for over 30 years. For him, the hallmark of a well-run, well-taught school was simple, the laughter of children. Daniel applied this logic to his search. As did, and in this side note, he had, and his wife had previously researched um, assisted living facilities, anticipating that there might be a time when they would both have to go to one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did their staff make the residents smile and laugh, or at least try to? To his abject disappointment, only one of the facilities came close to meeting his criteria, Magnolia Gardens. 
It was while going through this evaluation process that Daniel Kilgore realized he had missed a very critical element. Staff members cannot do it all by themselves. They need help from caring, compassionate, and devoted volunteers, but especially loving family members. In combination, they could maximize the degree of happiness and joy in the lives of the residents. During their tour of the gardens, Kilgore had a chance to speak privately with the executive director, Madeline Orsini, when Vivian, Daniel's wife, went off with a staff member to look at the recreational facilities. How do you manage it, Madeline? You've got staff members, volunteers, and visitors all over the place, Kilgore asked. Not normally one to partake in comedic repartee, she responded with a chuckle, in another lifetime I was a juggler in the circus. In the circus. No, seriously, how do you do it, Kilgore asked, somewhat annoyed at her flippant response. From the tone of his voice, Kilgore recognized she was serious. Her reply took a different direction. Well, for one, we have a very stable workforce. There is very little turnover because we pay our staff very well. Unfortunately, that's a negative for the loved ones who have their family, who have their loved ones here. Secondly, our director of volunteer does a terrific job in getting and keeping people who are interested in serving this, top, this type of population, especially when family members fade away. That's the last thing I would have expected, Kilgore said, family members not coming. His face furrowed, his furrowed brow reflected his perplexed state of mind. Don't be too critical, Daniel, Orsini said. The effects of dementia turn a person's mind into a giant jigsaw puzzle. After a while, they can't remember what pieces fit where, what faces belong to who, and to what memory. It becomes so painful for some, they stop coming. And then there are the others. The others, he asked? Yes, Orsini responded with, as the frustration rose in her voice. <clears throat> Those families who put a loved one here and think we can provide everything they need. We are not the familiar faces they long to see, nor the voices they need to hear. We can't share precious family memories because we're not the family. We can only be present when they choose not to be. We can't be the bridge to the memories of birthdays, anniversaries, graduations, weddings, the birth of grandchildren, memories of all that. All those events constitute the sum of their lives. Madeline's telling words had a profound impact on Kilgore. He would be that bridge. Daniel was not compulsive, but once the facts presented themselves, he was capable of making quick decisions. And that speaks basically to the staff and, and the, the issues they have in trying to deal with people suffering from dementia. Mm -hmm. okay. um, this, this section will cover Daniel's kind of perspective. Mm -hmm. As a fully tenured professor at the College of Charleston, it had taken a lucrative package to lure Madeline Orsini away to become the executive director. But it, that's exactly what the board of directors had offered, and she had it accepted. In addition to impeccable academic credentials, Orsini's physical presence added to her charm. Nearly five foot seven in heels, she had the look of a Hollywood starlet in professional attire. This one is for you, Daniel said, as he handed her one of the three bouquets he had in his hand. The others are for my friends, he said with a smile. Madeline thanked him and wondered why Kilgore and his wife, who had visited the facility over a year ago, he continued to come and visit certain residents. Do you mind if I ask you something, Mr. Kilgore? It's something of a personal nature. Kilgore set the remaining bouquets on the counter, ask away. His open nature had always appealed to Madeline. You've been coming here every week for well over a year, visiting the same three residents. Sometimes you come as much as three times a week. It is the kindest and most selfless thing I've ever seen. But you do realize that the moment you leave their rooms, they don't remember who you are or why you were here. Why do you do it? Though her, remarks, though her remarks were sincere, they were tinged 
with an objective realism. She sounded professorial in tone as if she was probing his motives so she could make some sort of value judgment. Kilgore was not accustomed to such pointed questions. He was somewhat shocked and taken back. Let's sit outside, shall we? Kilgore said, surprised by her question. Madeline stepped out from behind the counter and followed Kilgore outside to a large veranda. Magnolia Gardens was nestled on nearly five lush acres outside of Charleston, South Carolina. Besides the towering magnolia tree in the front of the facility, the property was liberally sprinkled with the iconic and omnipresent symbol of South Carolina estates, the Sable Palmetto. The outside veranda was covered by a huge pergola that extended nearly 60 feet in length and 30 feet wide. Flower pots filled with India pink, Helen's flowers, and swamp lilies hung along the perimeter beams of the pergola. There were dozens of spacious tables of teakwood with matching chairs available to residents, visitors, and staff. Kilgore and Madeline sat at one of the tables. His face saddened and brooding as he blurted out, You know, I don't come to see what they remember. I come to see, I come because someone needs to listen and remember. To make it seem, at least for a minute, that what they did had mattered. Listen to what, Madeline asked, a bit confused by Kilgore's obtuse answer. He looked at her. When he looked at her, Madeline noticed a dampness in his eyes. Your, their loves, their heartaches, their successes and their failures, those sometimes small, inconsequential events that made up the sum of their lives, some, someone should listen and remember. Madeline thought some woman would be very lucky to be loved by this man. She was having difficulty maintaining her professionalism and it was evidenced by her expression. You're amused by what I said, Kilgore asked reacting to the smile on Madeline's face. Oh no, Madeline said. I was thinking how grateful the families would be knowing that you visit their loved ones so regularly. Okay, very good. All right, so tell us how everyone can get a hold of this beautiful book. Well, Forgotten Flowers is available on Amazon. Uh, it's available um, at Mountain Books and through major... Uh, book distributors, and it's also available in Kindle format. Okay, all right. So it's locally uh, in or about and around Sonora. They can pick it up at Mountain Bookshop. Yes. And it, here's the scoop over in Jamestown. Yes, where I'll be speaking Saturday. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this Saturday? Uh, he, let's see, I believe... Oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> no, no, I beg your pardon. Okay, it's good. It's third Saturday. <laughs> Saturday <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Glad to hear that. Um, anyway, Forgotten Flowers by Michael J. Sullivan can be found on Amazon and Kindle. Thank you very much.